Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Examining the Witness. Um, this is going to be a really good episode, uh, because we, we're going to go a little bit faster than previously, um, and uh, also, we're going to be talking about one of the areas in the Witness that's, that's the most interesting and the most self-contained, and uh, one where I honestly believe that I have a kind of a you know, very specially complete perspective on some of the other areas. Uh, we previously looked at the reflection zone. Uh, it would be most natural after that to talk about the quarry, but to be honest, I kind of have no idea what's going on in the quarry. So we'll do that episode later, and we'll try and figure out together what it means. But with the fortress, I feel like I have a very uh, mature perspective on the super fascinating stuff that is going on uh, inside this castle. Um, so that's what this episode is going to be all about. It's going to be this this gigantic building and the very interesting puzzles that it contains. Um, so before we even go inside, there's a couple things to note here. Uh, so the fortress is um, it's it's an important area to uh, to the witness. If you look at some of the early concept art for the game, like on the development blog from years and years back, you will see these puzzles that are in here. Um, represented super early on so it was like part of the concept of the game from the very beginning um, it also uh, but but just approaching it I mean it's gigantic one of the things before I came to my current understanding of the fortress uh, I was always I was weirded out by by its shape by its appearance uh, and by its size I mean it's huge like it's bigger than the entire town it's bigger than any other structure on the on the island uh, except probably the, the lab in the mountain. Um, and of course you could say, well, you know, that's because it contains these large um, puzzles inside, so there was no other way around it, which is true. Um, but still, it's just aesthetically, it's like out of whack. Uh, and, and why does it have to be surrounded by these gigantic walls? Um, it means that there's two castles on the island, because remember there's the castle that we started in, and then there's this castle, so that, that seems a little strange, like why are there these two castles? And architecturally, it's totally different from the other castle. The castle in the starting area, it's like very... Um, it's very uh, fantastical. It's whimsical. It's uh, it seems like it's kind of a fairy tale castle. Um, and as you'll remember, perhaps from that starting episode, I uh, I compared it to the uh, sort of a Garden of Eden parable, um, and uh, and also to the castle that's talked about in Braid of Tim and the princess. Um, versus this, the architecture is very realistic. Uh, the witness famously hired like a real architecture firm in order to do work designing all of these uh, all of these structures on the island because they wanted everything to feel grounded um, and uh, and not just like some wacky design that a video game concept artist made up that wouldn't work in real life. Um, so so this is like the super realistic uh, kind of castle design as opposed to the starting area, which is still technically realistic. It's based on a castle in Portugal. It kind of looks like the Alhambra in terms of the garden layout. But, you know, it's, it's much more fanciful. Um, <clears throat> and not only is this a realistic and realistically large castle, it's like brutal. It's like very hostile. Um, as as we approach, we've got this spooky. I mean, the walls are like super high. Um, we've got uh, this like you know harsh looking portcullis here. This uh, that looks like it's gonna like slam down and take your head off or something with these like very kind of scary intimidating spikes. Um, we've got this stuff, which uh, is uh, if you're familiar with your medieval castle uh, battles. Um, that is boiling oil. Uh, back in medieval times, people would, uh, defending uh, castles in Europe, would uh, get these vats of boiling oil because boil, uh, oil has a higher boiling point than water. So you'd get it up to hundreds of degrees, and then you'd pour it through, uh, you know, holes in the uh, castle wall that were specially designed for this, and then it would pour down on the invaders. <coughs> Here you can see it down on the ground, um, and um, and then like boil them alive and give them these horrible burns and stuff. In fact, you can even see here one of those clever little art touches of the witness. There's uh, images of people falling. You can see the head here, the arms, kind of a jacket or something, and then two legs. Um, and then here's another person maybe, a head, arms, and then legs. Um, so uh, as if they're uh, like getting pushed off, of, repelled from the castle walls, like they're trying to climb it. Um, and so there's these images of battle. It's this very intimidating castle, which is totally at odds with the rest of the island, which is like so calm and just happy for you to be here and neutral and colorful um, to suddenly have these images of conflict and death. Um, 
and so that raises the question what is this castle area about um, so I we're, we're uh, well we're gonna talk about that in a moment so we walk up oh and one thing through here we can see uh, more of these splotches of oil coming through little holes in the roof. So this long area that's basically just designed to kill anybody who's invading. Then we come up, the classic symmetry of a symmetry and uh, and sort of um, uh, intentional like alignment of perspective uh, in the witness showing up here with this uh, framed gigantic tower. Um, <coughs> we And then we're in a nice little garden, just like the other uh, castle garden in the tutorial zone, or somewhat like it. Um, but we're going to go past this for now, um, because we want to start talking about what this castle is about. Um, so we're going to start on this other side. You come in here, you see a puzzle panel, and you also see, like, all of these people, right? Right now I got one, two, three, four, five, six people, and there are even more on this whole side of the castle. There are, there are probably more statues inside this castle than there are on the entire rest of the island, not counting the mountain. There's a lot of statues up there on the mountain. But there's an incredible density of, of statues here, and uh, and that's a big mystery. Oh, and of course, there's also there's zero even on the other side of the castle. They're all in this half of the area. Um, so what I think uh, ties this together, why the, you know, why the castle is here, why all these statues are here, um, is that this... Uh, this fortress, uh, the th one of the themes of this area is about society, and uh, and it's about uh, people and the organization of society, like social classes, social institutions, like governance and religion and things like that. Um, and those are themes that are absent from the rest of the game. They're the rest of the witness is like very uh, very happy to be for the most part about an individual experience, right? It's just about you. There's an audio log about where Einstein is talking about the society of true searchers that has very few living members at any time. Um, it's about a very personal experience and a personal quest for truth, and it's not doesn't have a strong uh, political messaging, although it shows up in some places, like in the Burke video and others. But in this fortress area is where uh, the witness is packing. It's almost... Um, the island is so against drama. Like, there's almost no story in the game. Uh, the... The island is trying to be a respite from that kind of like human drama and narrative that uh, and character that defines most storytelling. But in the fortress area, all that human drama is like packed in, like contained by these high walls, like almost like the game doesn't want it to to leak out to the rest of the uh, to the world. But there's a lot going on here, um, and. Uh, and the witness is saying a lot with all these with all these statues and with the structure of this area, which we will uh, talk about in the future. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let's see, should we do the puzzle? I guess I guess we'll uh, well we'll keep talking about the theme because there's just so much to say here. So here there's some people uh, fencing, um, and it's an interesting mix. It's kind of uh, ahistorical, right? So obviously it's a castle. There's kings and queens over there. Um, but if you look closer, you'll realize that these aren't gladiators. They're they're fencers. They're wearing like fencing masks. Um, and yet the sword that they're carrying is not a fencing sword. It's like an old timey, you know, like European knights and uh, soldiers thing. Um, this guy has like an electric guitar. Um, this lady is, uh, you know, she's she's sitting on a throne like a queen, but she's got modern high heels and a modern dress. Um, and this king up there, similarly, he doesn't have a crown, uh, and he's he's wearing sort of just like a like a overcoat or something, like a, a very modern type of dress, even though he's in the style of a king. So there, the witness is saying something. It's like, okay, our society might not be have like the same kind of comical king-like structure as as societies in the past, but we still have these social classes. There are people in charge, and there are elites, and, you know, things like that. Um, and then finally over here, we'll see some, there's some security guards, and uh, these guys also, they have, um, you know, they have sort of a secret service look to them, but they're also carrying these swords. So it's an allegorical scene um, that is representing the, the mix of the things that are common to human social organization, you know, 
over centuries. Uh, like there are people at the top, there are people at the bottom, things like that. Um, and there are certain roles that show up. Um, so to kind of, there's just so many big ideas in this area. I don't really uh, know how to how to start. Um, but uh, but the fact that there are these two areas are very important. The uh, the the sort of empty hedge mazes over here, and then these puzzles on this side. Um, I guess we'll kick it off with an audio log. We've got a couple of audio logs around here. This one's a little self-contained, so maybe we'll do it first. It's not that related to the stuff I want to talk about later, but it's interesting. Um, I boasted among men that I had known you. They see your pictures in all works of mine. They come and ask me, who is he? I know not how to answer them. I say, indeed, I cannot tell. They blame me. And they go away in scorn. And you sit there, smiling. I put my tales of you into lasting songs. The secret gushes out from my heart. They come and ask me, tell me all your meanings. I know not how to answer them. I say, ah, who knows what they mean? They smile and go away in utter scorn. And you sit there, smiling. Rabindranath Tagore, 1910. So that audio log, I interpret it as a bit of a, not an Easter egg, but a bit of a nod from Jonathan Blow, the creator of the game, the creator of uh, of the Witness, um, talking about, sort of alluding to his role in society and and how society sees him. Right. So here we've got this kind of rock star guy. Uh, he's a he's a he's a creative. He's making music, um, and uh, and in that um, in that audio log, uh, Tagore talks about create. I think she was a poet, and she was an Indian poet, um, but I'm not sure. And uh, she talks about people coming and asking her, like, "Oh, what does all of your art mean?" And how she has. She's kind of flummoxed by that uh, uh, question, or considers it naive, because if she could just explain what the art meant, then she wouldn't have had to have made the art. She could have just said what she intended. Um, but because she's trying to communicate these sort of subtle or complicated things, um, or or these kind of things that can't be exp can't be expressed in words, maybe then then there's no answer, um, and people in society are are. Uh, Kind of confused by that, they just they just want sort of the entertainment value, um, and so I think this is sort of Jonathan Blow talking about uh, talking about himself and and how he sees uh, his his role in society. He realizes that he's not playing a huge role in society, even though he's making this this game, which I personally think is a masterpiece. Um, you know, he he's recognizing that that most people are just sort of. Uh, seeing it as an entertainment product and that, you know, there have always been bards and storytellers and novel writers and things like that producing these artistic products, but they're a little bit on the sidelines of society. Um, so, uh, an interesting, another interesting little Easter egg here is, um, you might think that the, um, the queen over there looks like she's waving to this guy, right? He's clearly looking at her, um, maybe because he, he needs her sort of patronage to support his uh, lifestyle. But, uh, and I guess that's also sort of commentary on The Witness, is Jonathan Blow is saying, like, yeah, you know, I exist because, you know, uh, sort of I live in a rich society and people pay to buy my products and stuff like that. Um, and, but if we get close to this queen uh, and examine her gaze... Uh, in more detail, it's clear that she's not looking at him at all. She's not waving to him. She's actually admiring this big ring on her finger. Um, so what could that mean? Well, fortunately, we've got a second audio log, which uh, is tied more directly to the themes of this area. So we'll play that now. Our hangnails are incredibly real to us, whereas to most of us, the English village of Nether Wallop and the high Himalayan country of Bhutan, not to mention the slowly swirling spiral galaxy in Andromeda, 
are considerably less real. Even though our intellectual selves might wish to insist that since the latter are much bigger and longer lasting than our hangnails, they ought therefore to be far realer to us than our hangnails are. We can say this to ourselves till we're blue in the face, but few of us act as if we really believed it. A slight slippage of subterranean stone that obliterates 20,000 people in some far off land. The ceaseless plundering of virgin jungles in the Amazon basin. A swarm of helpless stars being swallowed up one after another by a ravenous black hole. Even an ongoing collision between two huge galaxies, each of which contains a hundred billion stars. Such colossal events are so abstract to someone like me that they can't even touch the sense of urgency and importance, and thus the reality, of some measly little hangnail on my left hand's pinky. We are all egocentric, and what is realist to each of us in the end is ourself. The realest things of all are my knee, my nose, my anger, my hunger, my toothache, my side ache, my sadness, my joy, my love for math, my abstraction ceiling, and so forth. What all these things have in common, what binds them together, is the concept of my, which comes out of the concept of I or me, and therefore, although it is less concrete than a nose or even a toothache, this I thing is what ultimately seems to each of us to constitute the most solid rock of undeniability of all. Could it possibly be an illusion? Or if not a total illusion, could it possibly be less real and less solid than we think it is? Could an eye be more like an elusive, receding, shimmering rainbow than like a tangible, heftable, transportable pot of gold? Douglas Hofstadter, 2007. So, um, Douglas Hofstadter is an interesting guy. Um, he wrote a fascinating uh, book about, uh, you know, uh, sort of consciousness and self-representation and thinking and uh, mathematics and structure called uh, Godel Escherbach, An Eternal Golden Braid, which Jonathan Blow has definitely read. He's like alluded to it on his uh, Twitter and things like that. Um, and uh, in this uh, quote, from Douglas Hofstadter, he's introducing a lot of stuff. First of all, it opens by talking about the same, this kind of self-centeredness that uh, that we see depicted on on the Queen, but also all these characters. Right, this guy uh, is sort of looking off to his patron. Um, the uh, the King here, even though these gladiators are are dueling it out like uh, for their lives. Right, this this woman looks pretty uh, desperate, and is there, and she's also looking off to um, to see sort of like gladiator style like like what she should uh, uh, what the victor should should do to the to the loser in this competition uh, but the king it's not entirely clear what he's looking at but he's definitely not looking at the um, at the gladiators he's kind of waving them off like you know stop that um, and just kind of staring off into space I guess it's like not much uh, not much there he's you know probably thinking about his own business affairs or something um, so that Hofstetter quote starts out by introducing that uh, that self-centeredness, but uh, what he's he's talking about there is not just people's uh, sort of he he's not really berating people for for their selfishness. Um, he's just talking about how as individuals we're all the central protagonist of our own story, and you know our. Uh, the, the closest thing to us at all times is our own body, um, and the the actions and objects and uh, concerns that are like that are immediately uh, that are like most immediate to our life. Those are the things that are most real, even if there are these abstract things like distant galaxies and other countries um, that are that from an external top-down perspective are uh, larger and more important. Um, and that that's a, a key idea of this area is that that the contrast between uh, we've talked about how in the witness uh in general there's uh there's a, a a theme of the contrast between the internal uh conscious awareness versus the external top down 
uh, objective scientific knowledge pieced together about the world. Um, and that contrast is reflected here. You know, the fortress, like so many areas of the witness, the fortress is sort of like a, a miniature version of the entire island. And the fortress represents that a twist on that classic dichotomy that pervades the whole island. So this side with all these statues and this, this type of puzzles that we'll get into later um, uh, represents the, the individual's perspective. And uh, this, this other side out here represents a more top-down external perspective that focuses on the environment and kind of uh, uh, where, where the individuals don't matter very much, right? So this is like the galaxies, the Bhutan, uh, that kind of stuff, versus this side is the individual's perspective on their own choices and actions, their immediate problems and, uh, and experience of society. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we'll talk more about that throughout uh, as, as we go further and, and get more new perspectives on what's going on here. And you'll also see more evidence for why this is true. Like, I'm just sort of bombarding you with, with what I think this area is about, but uh, but uh, over the course of in the next couple of puzzles, I'm going to prove it to you. Um, so we're going to st finally start doing what witness players do, which is looking at the puzzles. Um, <clears throat> we see a classic hexagon puzzle, but there actually is no starting point, um, which is pretty crazy. Like there's nowhere we can even begin to click. Um, and uh, but of course, astute players will quickly realize that there's this very strange system of glass pressure plates. Um, and that stepping on the glass pressure plates will uh, create, will cause the panel to begin to be filled in. And so what we got to do is just walk and complete this area, which uh, seems seems like a little bit tedious, at, you know, for, for a new player. It's like, where are you going with this, Jonathan Blow? This just seems like a much slower way of filling in the panel. Um, but it's, uh, it's also... There's some constraints because if you just like walk around randomly, then you'll end up creating these like crazy line segments, um, and uh, you know that's there's no way you're going to be able to uh, to create a puzzle like that. So or create a, a valid line. Um, so we've given a little reset key here, and we've got a plot out in advance so we don't accidentally walk over some part of this glass pressure plate that's going to create an invalid line. Um, so we got so we got to realize we got to start down here and then we got to walk in a straight line all around. How are we going to do it? Okay, we won't be able to go that way. So we're going to go up around like that and then we're going to make like a big L shape. Okay. And of course we have to remember where the hexagons are. So right now, like I think this spot right here is like I'm standing on a sort of imaginary hexagon right now. Now we're going to go back. Uh, yeah, this is correct. There we go. Let me get a closer look at the king there. Damn. So now that completes, and uh, this door opens. Over here we see some more statues, right? Here's our, our little guard, and here we've got some young people. I, I sort of interpret this as, uh, you'll see that the the uh, the social classes here, we have like these elites, they're like listening to music, people are entertaining for them, they have guards, it's a king and queen. Um, this is sort of a, I don't know, like a, a kind of up and coming, upper middle class type people, right? Um, and. Uh, and they're they're trying to make their way into this, uh, you know, climb their way up the social ladder. But of course, this guard is here. That is maybe uh, not interested in letting them through, or has some requirements. <laughs> so here we are in another area, um, and now of course the if the gameplay of this uh, fortress zone, which was not totally clear here, becomes clear with this puzzle because now we have some. Uh, logical rules yet again, just like with the hexagons that we have to obey, um, and yet we also, if if we if we just look at this, we realize okay, this is going to be easy. Just start down here, go up and go across. But there's this constraint. This panel is broken, right? We'd like to go straight across, but we can't do it because this panel won't light up. 
Um, and then also, when we get out here, there's like a hole in the ground. Earlier, we could we could step off and and uh, go go elsewhere, but now uh, there's this gap, and so we we're we're stuck on the line. Like we can't skip from one part of the line to the other like we could in the previous room. Um, so this is not going to work out, and uh, and we're going to have to think of a better way. Now, it's worth thinking about here, like what are what is the detailed mechanism of what's happening right now in the, in the player's head they're having to keep in mind basically two different panels overlapping they have to keep in mind a, a mental map of uh, of both of these panels and there we'll see there's another obstruction uh, right here which is that if we try to walk through here we're just unable to we can light it up but then we'll have to like travel around in order to uh, in order to actually get it to you know, get to the other part of the line. So we kind of can't walk through here because this thing is blocking us. Um, so we've got these extra constraints, and so we have to kind of keep two views apparent at the same time. The view of where can I, the player who's walking around, actually go uh, on the board, and the top-down abstract view of what shape do I want to make, have my line make in order to satisfy these constraints. Now, notice that that is those two views are going to they're going that mirrors what i claim is the theme of this entire area which is these two kind of uh paradoxical like both true but incompatible different views of society and of the individual's place within society so that side over there representing the kind of environmental side that uh that that where the in individual is not important and then this side of the castle representing the uh the importance of the individual um, so here we have the player having to keep uh, sort of those two different maps of uh, of the puzzle field in mind at the same time, which is like a gameplay manifestation of the area's theme. Um, so let's see, what are we going to do here? Um, well, I suppose we'll have to kind of keep the... We could, we could draw like... Uh, like a little S shape, and then oh, would that work though? No. Okay. So it's gonna have to be a little S shape, and then we're gonna have to go down and then go up again in order to keep draw a little box around the uh, around the white panels. Alrighty, let's go for it. So I'll go like this. Uh, skipping that broken panel, and now the two imaginary white tiles have been contained, and we just have this two others. Uh, what are we going to do here? Right, we're going to go all the way down, but then we were going to keep these two white tiles contained by drawing up and around like that. Boom. There we go. Activated. Door open. Um, I don't think there's any statues in this area, so we're just going to move on. We do find an audio log here. We're actually going to... Yeah, we're going to come back to that, because there's another area which uh, kind of belongs to the castle, uh, kind of kind of belongs to the mangrove tree area that we'll visit later. Um, but uh, out here, we get this nice perspective on a, a sort of a little forgotten side of the witness. Um, and, um, and there's this massive shipwreck out here. And the, the role that this shipwreck uh, plays in the story uh, will... We'll talk about that later when we when we get to this kind of treehouse island because it's really more related to that. But there's an audio log that's very important to this shipwreck um, that we uh, that we should discuss. Uh, that's very the audio log is has a lot of relevance to the to the fortress area is what I meant to say. So it's like absolutely huge, um, the size of a real container ship, just, just sort of like the castle is like out of scale with the rest of the island, because everything else is kind of cartoon scale, but then the castle is like full scale, and then this boat is also full scale.
and there's like so much stuff on this boat that I'm skipping over. There's some really beautiful environmental puzzles. There's like a vault down there that's super duper important. But we're not going to talk about any of that today. We're going to talk about that in a future episode. Right now, we're just for, here for this crucial audio log by uh, William K. Clifford. A ship owner was about to send to sea an emigrant ship. He knew that she was old and not well built at the first that she had seen many seas and climes, and often had needed repairs. Doubts had been suggested to him that possibly she was not seaworthy. These doubts preyed upon his mind and made him unhappy. He thought that perhaps he ought to have her thoroughly overhauled and refitted, even though this should put him at great expense. Before the ship sailed, however, he succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. He said to himself that she had gone safely through so many voyages and weathered so many storms that it was idle to suppose she would not come safely home from this trip also. He would put his trust in Providence, which could hardly fail to protect all these unhappy families that were leaving their fatherland to seek for better times elsewhere. He would dismiss from his mind all ungenerous suspicions about the honesty of builders and contractors. In such ways, he acquired a sincere and comfortable conviction that his vessel was thoroughly safe and seaworthy. He watched her departure with a light heart and benevolent wishes for the success of the exiles in their strange new home that was to be. And he got his insurance money when she went down in mid-ocean and told no tales. What shall we say of him? Surely this, that he was verily guilty of the death of those families, it is admitted that he did sincerely believe in the soundness of his ship, but the sincerity of his conviction can in no wise help him, because he had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. He had acquired his belief not by honestly earning it in patient investigation, but by stifling his doubts. And although in the end he may have felt so sure about it that he could not think otherwise, yet inasmuch as he had knowingly and willingly worked himself into that frame of mind, he must be held responsible for it. William K. Clifford, 1874. So, uh, like I was saying, there's a specific kind of literal meaning to the whole the boat and the families that has to do with the lore of the game, but, uh, but Clifford is saying some important stuff here, and, uh, and, and the witness is... This is a, an interesting and somewhat unusual audio log for the witness. Um, there's all of these quotes around here that are about religion, they're about God, um, they're about scientific knowledge, but this is like very hard-nosed, right? I mean, it's talking like, kind of like, should we throw this guy in jail? It's talking about society, uh, ideas of punishment and responsibility and duty, um, but of course it's also talking about truth-seeking um, because it's debating to what extent we should, we should hold the... Uh, captain responsible for his failure to form a justified uh, belief um, and to kind of allow himself to be deluded. So uh, this this ties in with the fortress area's uh, commentary on on society, and uh, this is saying, you know, a lot of the audio logs in the witness are sort of they're kind of laying out. Uh, what what the witness considers to be a starting point for investigation. You'll remember from the episode that I did about the reflections area how uh, we I I I thought that the Feynman vault that was located on the far far tip of the island, like like this primordial edge of the island that looks like it's like rock that's either falling into the sea or like rock at the beginning of the earth that's like just been emerging, you know, it's, it's very much the beginning of the island, and this ruins of this very ancient civilization are there, as opposed to very far away from the mountain, which represents the highest technological achievement, and sort of the culmination of the society um, of the island. And I talked about how that Feynman video, and some of the, some of the uh, things that Feynman said about, uh, about religion, and sort of skepticism of the, of the, of, you know, the kind of basic story of uh, Christianity and other traditional religions, um, that the witness was saying by placing that so much at the beginning uh, of this, you know, this place on the island representing a starting point, that 
that the witness was declaring that that sort of skepticism is not an endpoint, but that's like the basic requirements to sort of be admitted to this like philosophical realm of of truth seeking. Um, that like you haven't come to an end of the journey just because like you posted some memes on the Reddit atheism or something. Um, and this, in the same way, is 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 kind of laying out a requirement. It's saying like, well, you know, if you want to be honest with yourself, if you want to be a, a somebody who can find the truth then you have to be you know you, you have to be committed to not deluding yourself and you have to have a pretty strong commitment to uh to following the evidence where it's going to go um and investigating things um and avoiding um avoiding cognitive biases that are like for instance the ship captain who was who was uh kind of convinced himself that the ship was okay because it would cost him a lot of money if he believed that it wasn't okay. Um, and so this is sort of like a, uh, it's very similar to the uh, modern day philosophy of uh, rationalism as espoused on um, internet sites like Slate Star Codex, Less Wrong, other things like that, um, which is a little bit, you know, it, it doesn't show up on the rest of the island um, because it's this kind of like hard-nosed, empirically minded uh, thing. But... Um, but I think with that audio log, the witness is saying that, that first of all, is saying that this is a starting point for truth-seeking, and it's also in the context of the fortress, which is about different views of the individual. We'll see later on, on the, um, the environmental side of the island, it downplays the value of the individual, and it talks about how the environment is the most responsible. People respond to their incentives. People do what they have been conditioned for. Um, and uh, individual values and choices are kind of washed out by by the the averages of of uh, the population and and history um, and demographics. But this side of the island is is committed to the view from the individual's point of view, and in that view, values are important, uh, duties are important, and you know individual responsibility is very important. Um, so that audio log is laying out a view of what the witness thinks that individual responsibility looks like in a both a societal frame like you know the complaint about the the ship owner is like a very real practical thing like should he be thrown in jail or not but also a, a philosophical perspective on that all right so let, oops i can't hop off here without without triggering the uh the puzzle so i gotta go back the other way i wonder if there's a way to complete the puzzle so that you can actually walk there that would be interesting Never thought about that before. Um, so that audio log is also interesting because right inside the castle, there's another William K. Clifford quote that's very similar and acts as kind of a follow-up to it. So let's listen to that now right next to this statue of this super burdened guy carrying this heavy stuff, right? Is it not at all like the kind of social dilettantes over there with the high heels and the purse and the business suit like this guy's working hard he's still trying to climb the social hierarchy right he's coming from over here he's like making his way up but he's got a longer way to go and uh he's really uh you know it's it's a tough life out there for him evidently if a man holding a belief which he was taught in childhood or persuaded of afterwards keeps down and pushes away any doubts which arise about it in his mind purposely avoids the reading of books and the company of men that call into question or discuss it, and regards as impious those questions which cannot easily be asked without disturbing it. The life of that man is one long sin against mankind. But, says one, I am a busy man. I have no time for the long course of study which would be necessary to make me in any degree a competent judge of certain questions, or even able to understand the nature of the arguments then he should have no time to believe. William K. Clifford, 1874. So this quote is probably from the very same essay that the earlier uh, shipbuilding quote uh, is, uh, ship captain quote is from. And you can see how it's a kind of direct sequel or a, a direct uh, follow-up to that earlier stuff, right? So in the earlier one, we're thinking... Um, uh, well, the ship captain kind of deluded himself into this false belief, and then he's at the trial for the for the deaths of his families, and he's like, "Hey, I honestly believe this stuff," which 
to many people would seem like an ironclad defense, but William Cape Clifford is saying that's not enough. Um, it wasn't a justified belief because you deliberately, you know, you, you didn't fulfill your responsibility of watching out for these cognitive biases and engaging with the information that was available, and so you kind of allowed yourself to have this unjustified, sincere, but unjustified belief. Um, and that makes you guilty for what happened to your ship and all the immigrants on that ship. Um, and here, he makes the same argument, but he's jumping to uh, something that people would maybe consider even more counterintuitive and controversial. He's saying, you know, if, if you're just growing up in your tradition and you believe what you're going to believe because your parents did, then that also is kind of not a justified belief because just like the ship captain, you haven't uh, engaged with all the information that's out there. Like, maybe that would be a good excuse, like, hundreds of years ago, when we didn't know about people in other continents with other philosophical uh, systems. But nowadays, says Clifford, there's kind of no excuse for remaining provincial and not being a kind of cosmopolitan uh, citizen of the world in, in terms of what you, you know, how you construct your core beliefs about the world. Um, and so he has this very fun... Uh, kind of counterintuitive turn of phrase that's uh, if if someone is so busy that he can't follow all these complicated arguments, which is a very reasonable objection to that that apply to this you know complex problem and so many questions in life like political questions, philosophical things like they all you know you dig into some of these things and they're just they become like so complicated. And William C. Clifford is saying like, well, that's fine if you don't have the time to look into that, but then you don't have time to believe, because if you can't form a justified belief, then you're no better than the ship captain. The belief you have now is just arbitrary. Um, so so this, this uh, audio log is sort of a, a linking audio log between the idea, the, the idea on the ship, which is phrased in a very practical manner, um, to the philosophical ideas that are on the rest of the island. So the witness here is laying out the groundwork for what it considers to be the kind of uh, uh, rationalist, Bayesian, etc. standards by which people should uh, should kind of go about pursuing truth. But we're going to keep going. Um, so here we are. Ah, now just like before. Now we can't help stepping on like a medium part of the. Oh yeah, we can. Oh no, we can't. We can't. So so the constraints are getting harder on these puzzles, um, like this part is just going to be lit up, so that's kind of crazy. Um, it looks like, it looks like at least, you know, we're, we're going to end up doing something like that. Um, and then uh, come up here, that doesn't look so hard, uh, except I'm sure there's going to be something kind of uh, blocking our progress along that line, so let's see how exactly that works out. All right. This is going to have to get filled in, of course. There we go. And, um... Yeah, let's see. Uh, um... Yeah, it's only three long. Sorry, I'm just distracted for a bit. Oh, no, 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 I screwed it up. What am I doing? <laughs> Too high. Now we're gonna go up here. Ah, okay, but now we run into this problem. We can't get across, just like I predicted, there was some kind of error. But we can sneak around, because not, not all of these areas are blocked. Um, and, uh, and we can make our way over here to complete the line in a non continuous manner. we're in. Um, but now that we've gotten in, let's check out what's going on in this area. So, uh, you remember over in the first area, there there was no, um, the puzzle plates were right on the surface, you know, there's just like a couple of depressions in the dirt. Then there was this, some kind of like minor uh, underground uh, uh, little kind of depressions in the ground that prevent us from, from walking, but it's not that deep. It's like a couple feet, um, and it's only for about half of the 
uh, for about half of the puzzle, like this stuff, there's still plenty of the dirt is still pretty high up, so you can walk on it. Um, but, uh, but now in this third room, things are getting deeper and deeper. Um, it's like way down there, and in fact there's statues down there, and what are they doing? They're conducting all this sort of economic business, right? This guy is hauling these sacks of uh, probably grain, um, you know, buying and selling, uh, but they're like really deep in the hole. You know, the game wants us to be thinking like, you don't want to be these people. They're kind of trapped down there. They're working really hard carrying these, uh, these big sacks of grain. I think somewhere around here is like somebody with a scythe, like harvesting this stuff. Let me see if I can get a good angle on him. Yeah, there we go. Um, so you see right, right down there, it's a guy like harvesting this wheat. So they're like doing all this hard economic work. Um, so uh, this, this of course is, uh, this is Jonathan Blow again, just sort of illustrating those levels of society and and expressing the fact that he has sympathy for this guy over here, right? The, the William K. Clifford quote was kind of harsh. It was like, hey, like, get, you know, get out of this debate if you don't have time to, like, read all these super esoteric philosophical arguments. And Jonathan Blow is saying, like, look, like, you know, I understand that it's tough out here, and I understand that I, Jonathan Blow, am, like, the little rock star guy over there who only, can only do all of this kind of, uh, you know, fancy pursuit of his art because he's supported by this, like, you know, elaborate social system and just because he happens to find himself on top. Um, but, uh, so there's a, there's a nuanced message here. He's not condemning other people for, for not, like, spending their whole lives devoted to philosophy. Um, but he is saying that, you know, it's, I think he's saying it's okay to have, to have doubt or to be agnostic or to have no position on things, but people shouldn't have a false confidence in things that they uh, that they haven't investigated or thought about. Um, and it's also, of course, just sort of a criticism of of uh, of society that we have these rigid levels and it's difficult to move between them and things like that. So let's move on to the final puzzle. Um, here we get a nice little door opening. Unfortunately, we can't bust through here and, and hang out with the statues, but we can open that. It might be useful later. All right, so now we've got like some complicated rotational tetrominoes, and uh, of course we haven't done the episode that relates to the tetrominoes, but uh, I've already played the game, so I happen to know how this stuff works. <coughs> So, let's give it a go, maybe, oh, we got, uh, so, these all, of course, have introduced different mechanics, we had the black and white over there, we had the hexagon tiles over there, it's sort of a very easy mechanic, and then harder with the black and white tiles, and then the, uh, the tetrominoes, which are a more advanced, uh, puzzle, um, and now we've got the rotating tetrominoes, which are always a little bit, uh, difficult, and, uh, we also have symmetry look at how that goes down right um and so we've got the, the symmetry in play which is which is very funny because and very uh makes this like a super complex interesting puzzle because uh you as as the player you're completing this line you're also completing the other line the symmetry rules are in play but just like in the last area where we had to kind of jump from one part of the line to the other to complete it in a non-contiguous way maybe I'm going to have to find a way to kind of uh, jump and complete, like jump between one line and the symmetrical line in order to uh, complete that layout. But uh, but we'll have to see. Or I might even have trouble even getting over to the other side. We'll have to see how, how it works out. But right now, it looks like I can do a simple, um, uh, let's see, maybe maybe like an L shape, and then go up like that, and then that should work for the other side as well. So we're going to go one, two blocks up. Uh, uh, but I collide with myself. That's not going to work at all. How are we going to do this? No. No good. Okay, we're going to have to go like that. No, no. Oh, we'll go this way. We'll go this way around. I'll just make a little L shape. Of course. Okay. And we'll start. One, two, three.
Okay, so I'm here. It's open, but how do I get to the other side? Looks like maybe I could sneak around over there to get to the other line. Yeah. So what kind of statues do we have over here on this area that's like fully excavated? There's no dirt at all. It's just the bottom floor of what was once like a very kind of elaborate little castle structure here. There were like lots of rooms and things like that. Let's see if we can spy any illuminating statues. Uh, oh yeah, there's some. Okay, yeah, these people are really not happy, right? This guy, he's like in some kind of shock. This guy is like banging at the walls. He's like in prison down here. You know, these are the people at the very bottom of society. Look at these people. They're like absolutely miserable. You know, they're they're in a state of total deprivation. They're not going to be let out. They're being kept here. Um and uh and they're not happy about it. <laughs> there's one other interesting uh figure here, which is a little bit difficult to see. Yeah. Yeah, in there. It's like a a bishop right? This is like a Catholic style um, preacher um, who's like preaching to these like very kind of bored miserable people down here who are just stuck. They have nothing else to do um, and uh, I think I think if you get the right perspective on this then you can actually see the the kind of full criticism of this guy. He's got like bags of money in there, right? So he's like a corrupt uh, official keeping these people down, putting himself higher than everyone else, although he's still below ground. So, uh, so you know, he, he's not living that happy in existence either, even though he's extorting these people. Um, so this just ties into that. I mean, this is pretty like a pretty aggressive thing for the witness to do. The, the rest of the game, these statues are not like making these like intense social criticisms like they are in the in the fortress area um, but here you know the witness is saying like look at these people they're like preaching these like BS religions and they're enriching themselves and we're like trapping people and not giving them the tools to understand their worlds you know or, or reach their full potential because people are just like stuck doing this like difficult labor or uh, you know at least those people are like harvesting some wheat right but but these guys over here they're not doing anything to advance society their suffering isn't necessary they're just like trapped here um, for the enrichment of of these people that are like keeping them in a state of ignorance um, so that's pretty harsh um, but uh, but it's you know that's it's undeniable that that our society has many uh, many elements of that um, and then of course as a final irony due to the square layout of this area this zone of intense deprivation, uh, both both like economic, like poverty, but also just a limited amount of information, right? Like these people, all they can do is listen to this like droning preacher guy telling them these false dogmas. Um, and then we have this guard, like the, the good life is right over there, but the guard is here. Like, no, you can't get through here, even though it's pretty easy. Um, versus out here, these people have time to enjoy the kind of creative pursuits and... Uh, and, you know, entertainment and stuff, although they don't seem very interested in it. Okay, uh, this, this statue is a little bit interesting because this guard is, like, looking at this puzzle over here, which I think is the only place in the game, or one of very few places in the game, that, uh, that we actually see a statue acknowledging the existence of a puzzle panel. Um... This is also another uh, example of, of a sort of what I called in a previous episode a scientifically worthless puzzle. It's not actually scientifically worthless, of course, and especially not if you correlate them. But there's no way to complete this. Well, I suppose, actually, you can you can run through and it'll fail. So, so this isn't totally worthless because you do get a success and you get a failure. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of those out-of-place uh, orange triangle puzzles, which um, we'll talk about at a later date, but it's... The, the orange triangle puzzles are very interesting because they they're they're making a, a they're making an important statement about the game. They're not just a little Easter egg. It's like it's a very important choice to have them all scattered like that and to contrast with the way that ideas are explained step by step in the rest of the game. Um, okay, so having completed this uh, these four puzzles on the side, we actually could go up to the tower right now. 
um, and complete this entire area. So it's it's kind of it's it's like very bizarre that one of the easiest areas in the game to complete because it only requires like four, you know, it only contains like eight puzzles plus two more at the top, so that's like a total of ten puzzles. But half of them are optional, and uh, and unlike the symmetry area where you remember we had like a a bunch of uh, symmetry puzzles, and then there were those rock reflection puzzles. It was like a circle of optional rock reflection puzzles. Here, it's like choose your own. You only have to complete complete one side, and it doesn't matter which side. Um, so, in a way, it's like a super easy zone of, of the game to complete. Um, and uh, and that also, that optionality feeds back into um, into the, the themes of this area. But this is a completionist uh, speedrun, and also, uh, or long play, and uh, also it's it's super important to get the perspective of both sides in order to understand what this area is about, because this, this whole zone is thematically about the contrast between these two areas. So we're going to go back down here, and we're going to start from square one again, but this time looking at society from a different angle that involves zero statues and, uh, and zero sort of logical symbols um, and pressure plates and choices, and we're just going to be a little rat in a maze right here. Um, so starting with this garden area, it's just a little hedge maze. Um, nothing so strange as the pressure plates, but there are like these fences which block our progress. So it would be this fun little maze, except there's only one path through it. Um, and we've got to figure out how that is. Okay. So we came through right around. Yeah, so we, so we do that. We come here, we see this image of the maze, which is like, you know, you can complete it any old way. Um, but it actually fails us uh, if we do anything to uh, um, if we take any of these solutions. So, of course, an astute player will soon realize that just like the other uh, zones where where you're trying to uh, in the in the uh, in the other half of the fortress, you're trying to make a path through the pressure plates that matches the path that you want on the panels. Here, there was only one path through the environment. And so, once again, the path on the environment, it's, it's just like previously keeping the two maps in mind, but sort of the order is reversed. Here, you start with the environment, the single path that you could have walked through, because everything else was blocked by the, uh, by the fences. And that single path uh, then has to match uh, what goes on on the panel. So there's a reversal, and you're sort of a, like I said earlier, a rat in the maze. You're sort of a slave to the environment. Like, you had, you could have all these choices, and there, the, there's nothing stopping. Like, the game could have, like, recorded your motion as you walk through here, and then, like, that would be the solution, and you could just draw whatever you wanted, but the game didn't choose to do that. It's deliberately making it so that, like, you're, um, so that you're, there's only this one solution, and there's these very obvious things that are, like, saying that this was the only path that you could have taken. So we're going to head right into the next maze. Now, it's like, yeah, freedom, finally. You know, we can we can go whatever direction we want. So maybe we'll um maybe we'll take a simple one and we'll just hew to the um to the rightmost just like people actually do when they're in hedge mazes. We'll just stick to the far right to make it easy to draw a line matching that. There we go. Let's see how that works. No, it doesn't work. And it turns out that here, the uh, there's nothing so obvious as the fences getting in our way. But there's still a kind of secret path. You can notice some of these are full of grass, as if nobody has walked on them and crushed the grass underfoot. Um, so we want to take the path uh, most traveled by. So we're going to stick to this flat, crush down zone um, where there's plenty of room to walk. Let's see, it looks like we've got to go this way, so we're going to go around. We're not going to go through there. We've got to go around here. And then we're also going to go around here. So, you know, you might think this is just a variant of the many kind of environment-based puzzles, just like finding the apple uh, in those, uh, in the apple orchard puzzles. Um, but, of course, this is a, this, having environmental puzzles on this side 
And this is also similar to the symmetry area, where there's the logic-based symmetry puzzles higher up on the symmetry peninsula, and then closer to the water, there's those rock reflection puzzles that are about the environment. So it's just reminding of that duality of mechanics in The Witness, where some are more logic-based and some are more uh, kind of hidden environment clue-based. Um, but in this case, it has a specific meaning, which is like, I'm my path is being determined by the environment, and there's only one path. In those other areas, there are actually multiple solutions to each and every one of those puzzles, which we'll see later. <laughs> so now we know what's up, and we realize that you know there's probably going to be some special, uh, some special rule here. Um, but first, now that we've caught on, uh, the game wants to share with us some, uh, just like that Hofstadter, the Douglas Hofstadter quote about the uh, the I that notion of self being being like very central um, to to that ordinary perspective on the world, right? The Hofstadter quote uh, was talking about how people people feel that their sense of self is like this very solid thing. It's like the most real thing in the world to them. Um, but he's asking, what if that sense of self is a bit of an illusion, or is kind of shimmering, or isn't what you think it is? Um, and he's also, in, in different parts of his books, like in Go to Lecher Bach, uh, he, he comes out strongly against the popular conception of free will. And this is actually a very common position in philosophy. Like, you know, people who think about uh, physics and uh, the, the way the laws of physics work and the way our brains work, it's kind of impossible to see how, what it would even mean to make a free choice that is like not interacting with any of that, that's not just based on all of the inputs of like sight and sound and you know chemical reactions in the brain um so uh so douglas hofstadter saying that that sense of self uh that 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 people intuitively feel has these certain characteristics like free will and this kind of solidity and unchangingness. Maybe it's actually a lot more changing and ephemeral than we think it is. Um, or uh, maybe our our ability to to make free choices um, is actually uh, very different than than we think it is. Hofstadter does believe that humans make meaningful choices, um, but but that's compatible with the kind of de determinism uh, that that our actions are determined by our environment and by uh, our. Uh, in our, our experiences. So over here on the other side of the island, contrasting the Douglas Hofstadter quote, we have a B.F. Skinner quote from the famous uh, behaviorist psychologist. In the traditional view, a person is free. He is autonomous in the sense that his behavior is uncaused. That view, together with its associated practices, must be re-examined when a scientific analysis reveals unexpected controlling relations between behavior and environment. By questioning the control exercised by autonomous man and demonstrating the control exercised by the environment, a science of behavior also seems to question dignity or worth. A person is responsible for his behavior, not only in the sense that he may be justly blamed or punished when he behaves badly, but also in the sense that he is to be given credit and admired for his achievements. A scientific analysis shifts the credit as well as the blame to the environment, and traditional practices can then no longer be justified. These are sweeping changes, and those who are committed to traditional theories and practices naturally resist them. As the emphasis shifts to the environment, the individual seems to be exposed to a new kind of danger. Who is to construct the controlling environment, and to what end? Autonomous man presumably controls himself in accordance with a built-in set of values. He works for what he finds good. But what will the putative controller find good? And will it be good for those he controls? Answers to questions of this sort are said, of course, to call for value judgments. B.F. Skinner, 1971. So, uh, the placement of this B.F. Skinner quote is, is hopefully uh, clear now in context and, and really kind of cements uh, this interpretation that I've been uh, selling you guys on for the fortress area, which is 
he he's talking very very directly about this new scientific view that uh, now behaviorism is often considered kind of a decre- discredited uh, uh, branch of psychology that was kind of like zealous and uh, uh, thought that it had all the answers and B.F. Skinner in particular is like viewed as a bit of a villain today who kind of um, uh, like was very dogmatic and kind of like a dictator of this new field of, of psychology um, but what he's saying in this audio log even though he was thinking of his own psychology field of behaviorism and thinking about these details that are probably wrong. Um, But here he's talking abstractly, and he's talking about um, free will and uh, and people's sort of lack of free will, um, as he thought was revealed by the new science of behaviorism. Um, And that lack of free will, like I was discussing before we played the audio log, is something that is kind of generally agreed upon by scientists and philosophers today. Um, And so he's... Uh, he's talking about some of the uh, implications of that for our view of human psychology and also for our view of uh, society. Like, it's often objected, and, you know, this is, like, something that people debate, whether whether uh, a kind of philosophically and scientifically informed view of human choice and human decision-making, which which kind of goes against the traditional notions of free will, like, should that affect our ideas of punishment or you know, whether to give people credit or blame for their achievements. Um, and uh, so B.F. Skinner is uh, is addressing that uh, here. Um, but note, of course, that the witness, this is a contrasting view, right? So B.F. Skinner here is is saying that uh, this, this uh, absence of free will causes sweeping changes in society and we need to rethink so many things about about how we award credit or blame to people but then remember over on the other side of the island we had that we have that um that William K Clifford quote about the ship captain and that was really emphasizing like no people do they have uh they can be held responsible for whether their beliefs are justified or not and personal responsibility of that sort is very important and it doesn't matter if the ship captain was like brought up in a family that had never experienced a ship sinking or something like that and so he had the irrational belief that his ship wouldn't sink he can still be held responsible for that versus bf skinner is saying like oh you know we should we should uh you know we'll have to rethink all of this um so i think the the dialogue between these two things i think in the end the witness is saying that people do have that that responsibility as described by william k clifford so i think the witness would probably disagree with skinner when he says like oh we have to rethink all of like crime and punishment and stuff um based on the scientific view of free will but where i think the witness would agree with skinner is uh skinner's uh what he's saying about the environment right that if 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 so much of people's actions are determined by the shape of the world that they live in and by the social organization that they live in, then that that means that you can't um, that that questions about the organization of society are are crucial, um, and that you can't just be an independent uh, person like off doing your own thing and like society having having no effect on you um that we have a responsibility to make sure uh to to ask those political questions and uh and sort of make sure that we're living in a society that is that is justly architected um as we saw all the social organization over there although it's on the individual focused side of the fortress so it's like has all these statues is focused on the human drama people trying to climb the ladder what individual people are they succeeding or failing are they getting past the guards um but really all that drama kind of averages out when you look at it from a societal uh, landscape and so this side of of the fortress uh is which is less concerned with the individual is more thinking like well who created this whole structure right this fortress structure the division of society is there some better way that we could arrange things um which of course is a real open question who knows um it's also impossible to mention bf skinner without uh thinking that this is probably also a commentary on uh on video games and game design right because the the controlling environment could mean two things it could mean well it when skinner's talking about controlling environment he's talking about the uh like his psychology experiments and he's also talking about the structure of society as a whole and like the incentives and uh kind of uh information landscape that that human civilization creates um but 
In terms of video games, I mean, lots of people have heard the term Skinner boxes, which refers to this kind of slot machine-like reward system that's used in those like trashy mobile games to try and get people addicted to uh, buying the in-app purchases of like Candy Crush and uh, other sort of like uh, uh, mobile game type stuff. Which The Witness is obviously like very opposed to that kind of design philosophy. It wants to be very generous and very. Uh, have a collaborative rather than adversarial react, uh, relationship to the to the player. Um, so so in addition to a commentary uh, about society, I think placing this audio log here is also saying like, hey, these these systems that that video game uh, designers are creating are are important, and we need to you know that uh, they uh, we need to make sure that we're creating like morally good systems and aren't exploiting people. Um, and also, just like was alluded to in the James Burke video in the theater, um, just like uh, the James Burke video was talking about, was making a, a little bit of a political statement, and the witness was saying, we, maybe video game designers, have a place in making systems that can help people understand the world, right? I think the presence of this B.F. Skinner quote is also kind of contributing to that thread a little bit of saying maybe video game designers have a place uh, in in figuring out how we can design systems, um, you know, for society, potentially, to, uh, to uh, try and figure out better ways of, of organizing the world and, um, and uh, aligning people's incentives and uh, things like that. So, so the Skinner quote is very important. I think it's the only audio log on this side of the fortress, um, and uh, and it really lays out the philosophy for this area. Uh, of course, one of my favorite things right at the end of the uh, of the audio log is he says uh, he brings up all these huge questions about society and how we should you know remake everything. Uh, in order to avoid kind of domination by these by these like elite uh, controlling people who who are able to architect the rules by like the maze by which the rest of us like little rats in a maze have to run through. Um, so he brings up all these questions, and then he says uh, he says, well, things like that, of course, call for value judgments, which might have had some kind of special meaning and context. I think back in the day when behaviorism was, was huge, uh, B.F. Skinner was almost a sort of denial denialist of like human values and the internal perspective. He was like very weird. Um, but, uh, but in the, in the context of, of the witness, I think, uh, it, it carries a kind of I ironic twist that this, um, this, behaviorism, uh, psychology-based uh, view of history and society as being this kind of deterministic process of individuals just going about their lives according to their own, you know, tendencies and, uh, and upbringings and uh, behaviors that seems to have no place for human meaning um, or individual decisions um, or really, like, reason and logic, and yet when it comes time to, to try and figure out how we should organize that society, then it wraps back around and becomes a question of, uh, of logic and uh, meaning. So we're going to continue through here, noticing the ever subtler, um, ever more subtle um, variations on the environment. Now we have no grass, everything is this a uh, very uniform granite. Um, but if we listen carefully, some of the footsteps will actually sound different from the others. There we go. So there's like loud footsteps, and we want to follow the, the quiet footsteps. There we go. Okay, so I think that was, let's see, what did I go like, that, I think? I don't like that. There we go. And then we have the final puzzle of this sequence, which makes all the same footsteps. I mean, you could really drive yourself mad trying to find, like, the last, some subtle detail um, that is cluing you in. But the uh, what what ultimately uh, turns out to be the case 
is, so if we start here and keep the left side, we go around one little nub, and then we can keep going, and then we have to go around this L shape, um, and uh, we can't actually make that path. Like, that nub, uh, you know, we'd, we'd want to go around through here, um, but we can't actually do that. Um, and, uh, and also this L shape here is, is not represented, right? That would be, uh, like, let's see, I walk out and then around. So that would be, like, uh, out and around like that or something, or, you know, maybe like that. Um, and so we realized that this map is incompatible with this, um, with, it's like, it's like a, it's a different map. Um. And, which is interesting because it's not an environmental clue anymore, it's a logic clue. Although it's, you know, I, I'm sure people kind of get stuck here still looking for the environmental clue. So it's, it's interesting to bring back that logical element after these that were, that had a total lack of like, the kind of logic, symbolic thinking that is represented on the other side of the island. Um, but I think the reason why that's here, rather than just another subtle environmental twist, first of all, because it's just a great like, last minute curveball like I always love about The Witness, um, but also because it is reminding, it's being more explicit about the fundamental mechanic in this area, which is the two different perspectives, right? That each of these maps have had, uh, and especially the ones on the other side, you have to keep in mind both what's on the panel and the constraints of the environment. So it's sort of two different, um, two different panels and their different constraints overlaid on each other, just like the two different views of uh, free will and of the individual's place in society, the sort of Skinner view that uh, that we're all just kind of deterministically, our behaviors are just uh, are kind of predestined based on uh, the the uh, design of the environment around us, um, versus the individualist view of uh, of William K. Clifford and Douglas Hofstadter on the other side, where um, where it's all about individuals using their own uh, their own logic and reason and, uh, you know, and applying their own values to a situation. Um, so we're going to try and keep the two maps in mind as we move around. So we can do that, then we can move forward. But can we do anything after that? No, because I can't. Hmm. All right, maybe I, maybe I move halfway. So like there, and then go straight across and then up and around so now we went uh, up and around like that and then straight okay yeah it's gonna work nice All right, so here we are at the top of the tower, the culmination of this fortress area. Um, you'll notice if we look around, we can see the horizon from pretty much uh, everywhere, um, which indicates to us that this is the this is actually the second tallest point anywhere in the game, um, and uh, the only thing higher is is the mountain. Um, and this is by like quite a big margin. Like the next tallest place that you can get to is probably like this little monolith on uh, in the middle of a town, but it's it's not comparable at all. Um, so this is like way high off the ground, which which emphasizes the the extent to which the fortress is a microcosm for. Or, you know, you're, at the beginning of this episode, I talked about how gigantic the castle is and how it seems kind of out of scale. This the height of this uh, fortress of the keep is also kind of out of scale until you realize that this area represent and its themes are uh, are a, a, a miniature version a microcosm like I've said about other aspects of, of the game of it's it's like a, a a kind of miniature model of the themes and the relationships that are at play throughout the rest of the game um, so 
uh, where, where this keep is analogous to the mountain, um, these, uh, these two sides are, um, of course, they're, they're sort of reminders of the different mechanics in The Witness. These are much more logic-based about the symbols. These are about the hidden clues in the environment, which also allude to the environmental puzzles. Um, and, um, but also the themes of this, uh, of this fortress tie in to the themes of the, of the wider... Uh, of the wider game. So, on this beautiful island, um, the overall theme, as I've talked about in previous episodes, is all about uh, bringing together the... Or, or investigating, like, how could we bring together? What would it even look like to find some way of combining these two deep pieces of truth, sources of truth that we have about the world? The one being... Uh, objective scientific investigation, step by step, uh, all pieced together in this large hierarchy of knowledge um, about the external world. The other being a uh, sort of uh, the uh, kind of a philosophical uh, knowledge that that is immediately apparent um, and is based on direct conscious experience. Um, and these two halves look like uh, just uh, you know, so far, this has been most directly talked about in that audio log um, of the where the game is first explaining the separation of the black and white tiles um, in the tutorial area. But these two distinct, uh, 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 like kind of separate magisterium almost of knowledge, um, are it's they both seem so valuable, um, and yet it's like it's like quantum mechanics and general relativity. It's like you know, it's impossible to see how they could mesh. They seem like they're just in these two separate worlds. Um, and that problem is so big, you know, The Witness does a good job of, like, really exploring it and and taking it very seriously and, like, t looking at all these different angles on, on knowledge and on how we could try and pursue and combine these two sources of truth. Um, but it still just seems so big, like, obviously, you know, some video game from 2016 is not going to solve, uh, like, the world's most pressing philosophical problems all by itself. So, inevitably, it leaves off with, you know, with the question just, just, uh, with the question just as unresolved as ever, really. Um, and so, the fortress, I think, is very important to the witness because it provides a model for what it could look like to resolve those two totally conflicting, almost paradoxical seeming um, areas of, of belief. Um, where here on this side, we have a view of society and of the individual, which is, uh, which is, which is totally different from on the other side. We have this deterministic landscape where our every move through here um, was, uh, was like every player is going to put in the same solutions to this. And uh, and our whole um, our whole path through here is totally predetermined by the environment. There's no room for individual creativity or logic or aesthetics of like what puzzle solution you think is better. Um, and in fact, just to emphasize that point, um, up here there's this puzzle uh, panel which like has no logic symbols on it. Right? There's like no way that you could figure out how it's supposed to end. It'll fail you for almost any solution. Um, and uh, the the solution is to remember the exact path that you took through all of these, um, and uh, which would take quite a bit of uh, back and forth if I didn't have the image ready so that I could uh, quickly complete this. But um, but you have to remember that path, and so this puzzle is just like rubbing in your face how much of a rat in a maze you really were. That not only was each individual maze have a determin deterministic solution, but because of the way these doors unlock and open, you have to do these in uh, in a certain order, and this entire thing, just you have to solve it by, uh, by just doing this rote tracing of every move that you, uh, that you made uh, previously. It's like very top down, um, and your gives you this feeling of realization, like, wow, you know, everything I did here was planned out exactly in advance. They could have, uh, you know, Jonathan Blow and friends, uh, had, had perfect and total control over me as I was doing this. <laughs> Yeah, 
there's that laser since of course uh, it's uh, uh, since the only one half of the of the fortress is necessary and it doesn't matter which half I could have completed just that puzzle um, and that just that optionalness um, just serves to further emphasize the the kind of the equality and yet the paradox between these two perspectives uh, on the individual. <laughs> Versus this puzzle over here is completely different. So it's um it's all of the uh, it's all the previous puzzles. Um, but the, the logic symbols have been, like, uh, here, the four different mazes are all, uh, they're all, like, totally isolated, so it's the same exact maze. Here you might think, oh, it's easy, I'll just put together the solutions to these, uh, to these puzzles, which are, like, helpfully mapped out for us, right? So, like, we can go ahead and, and try and put in our solution here, which involves going up and doing like this in the uh, in the first area and then in the second area let me just consult uh, the uh, this uh, map here remember we well wait a second no in the second area we started uh, we started down there we started in that corner right and then we drew a little path around these guys I can't do that because the symbols have been kind of squished together like if there were more empty squares here then I could go back and I could start this one in the correct place um, but because everything has been squished together I can't use that same solution I can't just plug in the path that I took I have to make an entirely new path and it's got to be reasoned a priori based on you know my logical puzzle solving abilities which hopefully will serve me well or maybe I'll have to just resort to uh, to the image that I have looked up. So, okay, we're gonna get these guys in. All right, that's figured out. Uh, how are we gonna do this? Maybe. No, maybe we'll have to go around the other way. All right, we'll keep these guys in a separate little thing. There we go. Okay, oh yeah, we'll use the rotating uh, one, and then that, that's good. Um, and then we can just go like that, there we go. So this has like no overlap with any of these puzzles down here. Um, but, uh, so that, that emphasizes that logical, internally driven, uh, not based on the external environment, uh, philosophy that this side of the fortress embodies. Um, and then just to add to that, there's this brilliant uh, extra step, right, which is that over here, there's also an environmental puzzle right there that's just one path that covers the entire thing. Versus, um, versus on this side, each one of these uh, glowing shapes can be completed as an environmental puzzle, right? But what's this? I can't go through with this one because there's this column here blocking me, right? So we can solve, we can solve this guy. Um, but I can't solve any of these others because there's a king's throne getting in the way. Uh, even if I even if I had walked uh, a different way around this column, like it goes through this ink splotch, I probably wouldn't be able to make it through. Um, and then uh, around here, you know, I've got this blocking me, and uh, you know, I can't complete this one because it's got uh, it's got these uh, planks in the way. Each one of these puzzles has can be solved in like at least two different ways, in in, in multiple different ways. And, uh, and so, like, you can solve this in a way you can go around, 
you can make this like silly S curve around here to avoid uh, this stack of bricks and this stack of bricks and then you can go like that to avoid the throne because you only have to pick up the hexagons here and here I think um, so if you draw the proper path here then uh, then you can um, you know you can complete the the environmental puzzle so what these environmental puzzles are, are teaching you is it's it's just f it's forcing you to realize that each one of these puzzles has a different valid solution right and then the same with this one you could draw something that would avoid this these columns and uh, and this splotch um, and uh, here it's even possible to draw a different uh, solution that uh, that uh, like like starts from instead of uh, the line starting from this place and then ending on this close uh, ending point uh, each line goes across the whole map and ends in this more distant ending point um, and then you can get a separate uh, thing there so with with this it's forcing you to realize that each one of these puzzles it's like this super beautiful way of causing you to realize that each one of these puzzles has uh, multiple solutions um, versus here the environmental puzzle and uh, and this puzzle that unlocks the laser are uh, are both forcing you to realize that there was there was no room for a uh, variation um, in uh, in any of this um, there's another environmental puzzle here but it's just sort of a nice nice little colorful one I don't think that has any special meaning um, so that's the fortress area and it you know, it's it's. Uh, I think it's it's important in a lot of ways. It's a microcosm for the overall themes of the witness. There's so many dualities. Oh, and of course the keep. We're so high up here. Again, the second highest point in all in all the game. So it's a metaphor for the mountain, um, and it also represents that top-down perspective on society. Right? We can see our whole path from here. Versus when we're down on the ground, we're like blocked by all the stuff. We have it. You know, we can't see past the walls. We can't see the whole structure. Versus now, we're up here. It's like that B.F. Skinner perspective, the top-down perspective on all of society. We can see all the social classes at once. We can see their lines of sight and the games that they're playing with each other. Um, versus when we're down on the ground, we have that individual perspective. We're the rat in the maze. We're the individual person trying to move through society. Um, so there's so many like dualities at play here, which mirror the the larger questions and the other thematic dualities uh, throughout the witness. Like our very next episode is going to be about the monastery. Notice how that's like directly aligned across from the castle um, and uh, so that's like an even there's like hierarchies upon hierarchies and dualities within dualities uh, there's so much structure in the witness but the the fortress is a particularly strong and particularly self-contained uh, in part due to those intimidating high walls um, particularly self-contained uh, kind of uh, lesson about what the witness is about and because it's addressing a question, that question of free will, which has already sort of been solved by scientists and philosophers, you know, ultimately debates about free will among, like, learned folk um, often devolve into just debates about words where everybody kind of agrees on the fundamentals of, of what's going on. They agree that humans make real choices and that those choices matter and they're intelligent. They also agree that laws of physics hold true and there's no, like, magic going on. Um, so, so everybody is sort of a compatibilist on free will, but once upon a time, this must have seemed like a, a totally intractable question, right? And they, they do seem like these totally paradoxical perspectives, like how can we have these society full of individual agents who are all struggling for their own ideas of good and evil and, uh, and applying their own values and like using their own, using logic and reason to think through what's right. And yet we end up with a society which on the large scales and from the top down looks so deterministic, you know, like the winners of elections are just determined about like the demographics, like are there like more, uh, you know, like suburban woman voters than, uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, and so resolving this paradox i think the witness is saying means this even though it's a criticism of uh, of society and sort of a confined place for a lot of negative emotions and human drama that the witness wants to banish from the rest of the island i think ultimately this fortress is meant to be on a philosophical level an inspirational example to to say well this was an impossible seeming paradox between these two perspectives that both seem to be true but it seemed like there was no way to connect them and yet nowadays it's accepted that you know the compatibilist views of free will are largely correct and they've been outlined by people like Douglas Hofstadter and B.F. Skinner um, and um, 
and we sort of have this unified view of knowledge, and it's this wonderful thing. So maybe, says the witness, maybe someday the same could be true of, uh, of our, our perspective on all of reality, and questions like, why does anything exist at all? Or, you know, what's the nature of conscious experience, and where does that come from? You know, is the universe fundamentally based in consciousness and ideas, or is it fundamentally uh, based in, in uh, physical law? Um, so that's what the fortress is trying to do. That's why I consider it so exciting. And finally, to all those haters out there who say that the witness is, you know, it's just about truth in the abstract, or it's just like a, you know, some kind of a troll move to say that, like, there's no meaning even when we search for meaning or something. It's like, no, this, this is, like, super complex, specific ideas that the witness is laying out. And every part of the witness, e even places that I don't fully understand, like the quarry that we'll talk about later, um, but it's... You know, when you see something like this, uh, and you see all of the all of the structure and ideas that go into it, um, it's it it kind of amazes me that people can play the witness and and not pick up on this or think that the game only has some very vague overall theme of like you know it's about science or something like that. Um, so that's the fortress, um, and we'll uh, see you again. I'll see you again soon for a future episode of the witness where we're going to talk about. The, uh, the the sort of companion to uh, to the fortress, which is this beautiful monastery over here. Um, so that's all for now.